All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our March 2023 RMT's pre-test rationalization. I'm Doc Gab, and I'll be uh, doing the rationalization for this pre-test. Okay. So this will be part one of the rationalization. We'll be discussing three subjects. No? So clinical chemistry, uh, micropara, and clinical microscopy. These are the day one subjects in the board exam. Okay. And again, this uh, questions so are based from feedback from the August 2022 takers. So basically recalls, no? Kung ano ba yung mga uh, lumabas ng last board exam. Although we would we do not claim that these are the exact questions, no? We just uh, base this on the idea of the questions in the last board exam. Okay? So let's start with clinical chemistry. So last board some feedback was uh, clinical chemistry was somehow more difficult no compared to the past years. Okay? So hindi natin siya dapat baliwalain. For yung mga previous years kasi one of the easiest talaga ang clinical chem. But noong August 2022, biglang umirap siya. Okay? Pero of course, kayang-kaya pa rin naman natin yan. Okay, so first question. This is the main organ responsible for, for controlling blood glucose by releasing newly synthesized or stored glucose in the bloodstream. Okay? When blood glucose is low and by using and storing glucose when blood glucose is elevated. So what is this organ? This organ is the liver. So himayin lang natin yung question, guys. No? So sabi dito, main organ responsible for controlling blood glucose. Okay? By releasing newly synthesized or stored glucose in the bloodstream. So, ano ba yung process, no? Kung saan we create or we synthesize new glucose. What do you call that process? Type na sa chat box, guys. What is this process where you create new glucose molecule no, from non-carbohydrate sources? All right, very good. This is the process of gluconeogenesis. Okay? So, gluconeogenesis. Okay, keyword nyo dito, guys, yung neo, new, bago. Okay? May mga board exam. No? Actually, madalas itong tinatanong. Ang tinatanong is yung definition ng gluconeogenesis. So, synthesis ng bago, ng new glucose molecules from non-carbohydrate sources. Okay? You also have stored glucose. Okay? Saan ba tayo nagsistore ng glucose? Now, one storage for glucose would be your glycogen. Okay? And the process by which you create glycogen or where you store glucose as glycogen is the process of glycogenesis. Okay? So sa glycogenesis, no, remember, glucose to glycogen po yan. Halimbawa, kumain ka ngayon, no, ang dami mo pa rin glucose. Ang dami mo na energy, ang dami pa rin extra glucose. Yung glucose na yan, we can store that as glycogen. Okay? Particularly in the liver and in your muscles. And we call this process as glycogenesis. Okay? Ayan, ito yan. Storing glucose when blood glucose is elevated. Yan, yan, yan yung glycogenesis, to be exact. Okay? Now, kung babalik ta rin natin yan, glycogen to glucose naman, okay, mababa yung blood glucose mo, no? yung glycogen gusto may break down to glucose. Now, this is now what you call as the process of glycogenolysis. Okay? So, whenever you hear the term lysis, ang ibig sabihin lang po niyan is breakdown. So pag sinabi natin glycogenolysis, breakdown of glycogen and release of glucose. Okay? So sa question na to, we are looking for an organ, okay, which is capable of gluconeogenesis and also capable of glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. Okay? And this organ is the liver. Okay? So very important, no, ang uh, liver, no, in your carbohydrate metabolism. Okay? So this table is from your bishop. Okay, have you seen this table? You have to memorize this table no kasi madalas sa board exam tinatanong yung definition ng mga terms na to. Sayang ang one point, guys. Okay, kasi most likely tama yung mga ibang students no pag ito ang tinanong. Okay? So when say glycolysis, okay? Metabolism of glucose molecule to pyruvate or lactate for the production of energy. So ang purpose po ng glycolysis is production of energy or production of your ATP. Okay, so this happens no by converting your glucose to either pyruvate or lactate. Okay, so kailan siya naging pyruvate? Remember na naging pyruvate ng glucose if your glycolysis is aerobic. Ibig sabihin, it happens 
in the presence of your oxygen. Okay? Kapag anaerobic naman ang glycolysis, okay? anaerobic ang glycolysis, glucose is converted to lactate. Okay? So again, ah, ulitin ko lang, pag glycolysis, glucose to pyruvate or glucose to lactate. Okay? Aerobic, pyruvate. Anaerobic, lactate. And what is the purpose of glycolysis? To generate or to produce energy. We have mentioned gluconeogenesis a while ago. Okay? So creation ng bagong glucose. Glycogenolysis, breakdown ng glycogen. Glycogenesis, conversion of your excess glucose to glycogen. Then I say lipogenesis, conversion of carbohydrates to fatty acids. Okay? Lipolysis naman is decomposition of fat. Okay? Remember, lysis no breakdown. Decomposition. Yan, pareho lang yan. Okay? So please memorize this table. Alright, let's continue. Madali lang yung question number one. Ang dami nakatama. Ilang percent yun? Ayan, 73%. Tandaan nyo sa clinical chemistry, ang paboritong organ natin, liver. Kung sa clinical microscopy, paboritong organ yung kidneys. No? Dito sa clinical chemistry, most of the time, it would be the liver. Okay? Pero hindi ko sinasabing liver lagi yung sagot nyo. Eh, sa clinical chem. Basahin nyo pa rin mabuti yung tanong. Okay, next question, normal value. No, na question, normal values for blood pH and for PCO2R. So for blood pH, it would be 7.35 to 7.45. Okay, for PCO2, okay, it would be 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. Okay, madaling tandaan to guys. No? Kung alam nyo na yung pH, you just drop the 7. So tanggalin yung 7 and you will now get the normal value for PCO2, 35 to 45. Okay, so... For the past years, no, bihira sila magtanong ng normal value sa clinical chem. And in, itong past na board exam, ayan, may tinanong sila, normal value for your blood gas parameters. Okay? These are the various blood gas parameters. You have pH, PCO2, PCO2, bicarbonate, total CO2, carbonic acid, and oxygen saturation. Okay? Sa table na to guys, very important. Kabisado po ang reference ranges. Okay? Hindi man kayo tanungin directly, what is the normal value or what is the reference ratio? Hindi man kayo tanungin directly, mahalaga pa rin ito no, sa interpretation ng ating acid-base disorders. Okay? So for pH, again, the normal value is 7.35 to 7.45. Uh, for PCO2, 35 to 45. For PO2, 80 to 110. Okay? Some books would give you 75 to 100. Okay, millimeters mercury. Okay? Personally, mas madaling tandaan to sa akin. Bakit? Ano ba tong 75 to 100 na to, guys? Familiar ba kayo dyan sa 75 to 100? Anyone? May familiar ba sa 75 to 100? I'm sure familiar yan. Yan yung grades na kailangan natin no, to pass the board exam. No? From 75 to 100. Pag pumasa ka ng boards, makakahinga ka na ng oxygen. No? So yun yung pal palatandaan natin dyan. PO2, oxygen, no? 75 to 100. Makakahinga ka na ng oxygen kapag nakakuha ka ng grade na 75 to 100. Okay? For bicarbonate, it would be 22 to 26 millimoles per liter. For total CO2, 23 to 27. So, mababansin nyo, yung normal value ng bicarbonate na total CO2, malapit sa isa't isa. Piso lang yung difference. Oh. You know, piso lang ang difference. Bakit? Remember that 90% no, of your total CO2, 90% of total CO2 is bicarbonate. Tinanong na sa boards to before, guys. Tandaan nyo 90%, no? Okay, 90% of total CO2 is bicarbonate. So, it is not surprising that malapit yung normal value ni bicarbonate at total CO2 sa isa isa. Okay? Carbonic acid is 1.05 to 1.35 millimoles per liter. Kung may kakalimutan kayo sa mga reference ranges, ito po yun. Bakit? Kasi po, you can actually compute for the carbonic acid using your PCO2. You multiply PCO2 by 0 0.03. And that's your uh, that's the carbonic acid. Okay? Then oxygen saturation greater than 95%. Now, aside from memorizing the reference ranges, I want you to memorize this. Yung derivation. Paano nakukuha yung blood gas? Or paano na measure yung mga blood gas parameters na to? 
Okay? So for pH, PCO2 and PO2, the first three, okay, yung puro P ang simula, pH, PCO2 and PO2, these are directly measured using electrodes. Okay? They are directly measured using electrodes. Okay? For pH and PCO2, remember that the principle is potentiometry. Okay? In one board exam, tinanong, no, what is the principle of the pH electrode? Oops. What is the principle of the pH electrode? The answer is potentiometry. Same board exam. What is the principle of the PCO2 electrode? Ano sagot, guys? Potentiometry pa rin. Okay? So kung alam mo yan, two points ka sa board exam. Okay, very important yan no? for clinical chemistry. Now for PO2 electrode, what do you think is the principle? Yung nakakalala kaya? Tingnan nga natin. Can you type uh, your guess sa chat box? Pero baka iba, alam nila ito. No? Ano po ang principle ng PO2 electrode? Alright, very good. no. So the PO2 electrode depends on amperometry. Okay? Again, please memorize the principles of these electrodes. And again, remember, the first three parameters here are directly measured. Okay? Now, for bicarbonate, bicarbonate is a calculated value. Okay? Bicarbonate is actually computed using the henderson hasselbach equation. Okay? henderson hasselbach equation. Ang ginagamit to compute for the bicarbonate. This was actually asked during our boards. No? So, sa, ang tanong doon, what is the uh, blood gas parameter calculated using the henderson hasselbach equation? So, the answer is bicarbonate. Okay? Now, total CO2 is also calculated. You just add your bicarbonate and carbonic acid. Kaya nga siya tinawag na total. Okay? So, you add all forms of carbon dioxide. Okay? Then carbonic acid, as mentioned a while ago, it is calculated by multiplying PCO2 by 0 0.03. Okay, so tandaan niyo na po ito. Okay, then for oxygen saturation, we measure this directly using your oximeter. Have you seen an oximeter? Sino nakakita na guys na oximeter? Medyo sumikat pa nung COVID, no? Yung parang stapler na nilalagay sa daliri. That's your pulse oximeter. Okay, and uh, we use that to... Uh, measure your oxygen saturation. Okay? Pag may naririnig kayo, uy, nagde-desat yung pasyente. Ibig sabihin nun, nagde-desaturate yung pasyente. Bumababa yung kanyang oxygen saturation. And uh, ang, ang gamit natin to check for that is yung pulse oximeter. Okay? Nice to know. Alright, next question. Which of the following hormones cause a decrease in both serum, calcium, and, uh, both serum, calcium, and uh, phosphate? Okay, so the uh, the correct answer here is calcitonin. Okay, although majority answered calcitonin, marami pa rin sumagot ng uh, parathyroid hormone, marami rin sumagot ng all of the above. No? So tandaan nyo guys, no, ang nagkakos lang ng decrease in serum calcium, no, ang nag-iisang hypocalcemic. Okay, ang nag-iisang hypocalcemic is your calcitonin. Okay, si vitamin D at para thyroid hormone, pareho pong hypercalcemic. They cause an increase in vitamin, uh, in increase your, an increase in your calcium. Okay? Please remember that the hormones involved in your calcium regulation, you have your parathyroid hormone, vitamin D, and calcitonin. Okay? In the, when you talk about calcium regulation, yung vitamin D ninyo acts as a hormone. Okay? So we, we consider that as a hormone here. Okay? So para thyroid hormone, again, as mentioned, hypercalcemic po siya. Secretion is stimulated by a decrease in calcium, which makes sense. Di ba? Pag bumaba ang calcium mo, gusto mo siyang tumaas. Hindi na magpapataas sa kanya para thyroid hormone. So how does this work? How does this hormone work? So ito si para thyroid hormone, coming from your para thyroid glands, of course. Okay? It would cause an increase in bone turnover, or yung tinatawag nating bone resorption. So magre release ka ng calcium from the bones, hypercalcemic. Okay? It also causes an increase in tubular absorption of calcium. So sa kidneys, okay, imbis na iihi mo yung calcium, nirereabsorb mo siya. So anong effect nun? Hypercalcemic din. It also stimulates renal production of your active vitamin D. And remember, vitamin D is also hypercalcemic. Okay? So how does it become hypercalcemic? 
it increases the calcium absorption in the intestines. Okay? Kaya nga, no, kapag ka, siguro napansin nyo to guys, no, especially sa mga mothers ninyo or some ladies no, here, uh, pagka may calcium supplement, diba, may vitamin D rin na kasama yun. Usually combination siya. Bawa yung caltrate. Have you heard of caltrate? Yung mga parents yun, baka nagtatake ng caltrate. So si caltrate, aside from calcium, may vitamin D na kasama. Kasi yung vitamin D, ini-increase na yung absorption ng calcium. Okay? O, yun yun. Kaya ganun siya. It also enhances the effect of PTH on bone resorption, further contributing to hypercalcemia. Okay? Now, calcitonin. O, ito yung tanong ko sa inyo, guys. No, anong organ ang nagpaproduce ng calcitonin? Ito yung kadalasan nakakalimutan ng students. Which organ produces calcitonin? Last board exam, madaming endocrinology. So make sure that you really study endocrinology. So sa ang organ po, galing ang calcitonin? Okay, how about the others? Try to guess. Okay, very good. Calcitonin is actually produced by the thyroid gland. Ayan. So akala nyo yung thyroid gland po, thyroid hormones lang. Hindi po. Okay. Aside from the thyroid hormones, okay, the thyroid gland also produces calcitonin. Ay, ay actually, nandito sa slide. Ayan. Medullary cells of the thyroid. Ayan. So it inhibits the action of both PTH and vitamin D. Contrabida siya, kumbaga, kay PTH and vitamin D. So ang effect niya would be opposite of PTH and vitamin D. Okay? Ang effect niya would be hypocalcemia, lowering of your serum calcium. Okay? Nagets po yun. So again, what are the three hormones involved in calcium regulation? Memorize yun na ngayon, guys. Para thyroid hormone, vitamin D, calcitonin. Okay? Yun yung gusto kong ma-develop nyo. No? Pag may lecture, try to memorize already as much as you can. Okay, I'm not saying memorize everything. Hindi nyo magagawa yun. Okay, unless photographic kayo. Pero when you're trying to listen, no? when you're uh, uh, attending a lecture, Okay? Try to absorb as much as you can already. Hindi yung mindset nyo, ay, ay mamaya ako na yung may memorize. No? Pag ganun kasi, mayayari, yung brain mo, magre-relax yan. Okay? Papasok sa isang tenga, lalabas sa isa. Ganun yung mangyayari sa lecture. So, pag nakikinig, be as attentive as possible. No? Especially mga magre-review na. Okay? Maximize your time. Okay? Habang nakikinig kayo, memorize already as much as you can. Okay? Next, the nine gap is important when categorizing which type of acid-base disorder. So majority answer this correctly. 65% of students no, answer this correctly. The answer is metabolic acidosis. So pag-usapan natin itong anion gap dahil paulit-ulit siyang tinatanong sa board exam. Okay? The anion gap represents the difference between unmeasured anions and unmeasured cations. Okay? So tandaan nyo na to, this is one question in the board. Same definition ng anion gap. Okay, unmeasured anion, unmeasured cation. Okay, in that exact order. Okay, useful in indicating an increase in one or more of the unmeasured anions in the serum. And also as a form of QC for the analyzer used to measure these electrolytes. Okay, so these are the causes of elevated and low anion gap. Okay, before hindi ito tinatanong, no? pero in the past two to three board exam, nag-start na rin sila magtanong regarding this. Okay. So, low anion gap, this is caused by hypoalbuminemia and severe hypercalcemia. Elevated anion gap naman, you have your uremia or renal failure, ketoacidosis, methanol, etc. Okay, even hypernatremia nandito. And even instrument error. Okay? Also, please memorize the formula for the anion gap. We have here two formulas for the anion gap. So, the first formula, sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. Okay? Sa pangalawa naman, sodium plus potassium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. Okay? So, may tanong before, no? Ano daw yung electrolyte na pwede nating uh, hindi i-measure but we are still able to compute for the anion gap? Anong electrolyte yun, guys? Type na sa chat box. One point yun sa board. Please don't forget. Alright. So, kitang-kita naman dito, no? Doon sa isang formula, wala si potassium. Pero kaya pa rin mag-compute for the anion gap. Okay? Memorize na rin po natin reference ranges. No? For the first formula, kung, wala, kung saan wala si potassium, the normal value is 7 to 16. 
Okay? Dito sa formula na may potassium, it would be 10 to 20. Okay? Of course, depending on the reference, pwede magbago po iyan. Okay? Now, ano ba yung sinasabi nung tanong natin? Ano daw yung acid basis order na kailangan ng anion cap? No, that would be metabolic acidosis. Bakit? Ito guys, no? meron tayong tinatawag na metabolic acidosis with elevated anion gap. Meron din tayong tinatawag na metabolic acidosis with normal anion gap. Okay? Or we can also call this as HAGMA. Okay? Sa internal medicine, yung tawag namin dyan, HAGMA. No? Ibig sabihin na HAGMA, high anion gap, metabolic acidosis. Ito naman po, ito yung tinatawag nating NAGMA. Okay? Normal anion gap, metabolic acidosis. Okay? So as you can see, ang metabolic acidosis, it could be divided into two, depending on the anion gap. Okay? Ano mas significance nito? Yung HAGMA nyo, yung high anion gap metabolic acidosis, these are conditions that introduce more hydrogen ions into your blood. Okay? Remember, pag mas maraming hydrogen ion, mas acidic ang isang solution, like your blood. Okay? So kapag yung metabolic acidosis may due to elevated hydrogen ions, HAGMA ang mangyari dyan. Okay? Now, if your metabolic acidosis is due to a decrease in bicarbonate, okay, decrease in bicarbonate naman ng cost niya, this would now appear as NAGMA, normal anion gap, metabolic acidosis. Okay? Now, enumerated below are the causes of your HAGMA and NAGMA. Hindi pa naman ito tinatanong sa boards, no? but you will never know. Okay? Mas magandang uh, prepared tayo for this. Okay? But uh, just in case hindi nyo man ma-memorize ito, Okay, just remember yung cost ng ng hagma at nagma. Again, pag hagma, high anion gap, okay, ang cost would be introduction of more hydrogen or introduction of more acid into the solution. Yung nagma naman, this is caused by a decrease in bicarbonate in your solution or in your blood. Okay? Claro to guys? Kung clear po ito, please type RMT on the chat box. Tandaan nyo, again, ang acid basis order na nakakailangan ng anion gap is metabolic acidosis. Alright, let's continue. Next, thrombism is caused by use of the following metal. So a lot of you got this correctly. This is actually lead. Okay, first time tinanong to sa board, marami nagulat. Ano bang plumbism? Okay, that is actually lead poisoning. Okay. Lead. lead is a cumulative toxicant that affects multiple body systems and is particularly har uh, harmful to young children. Okay, before, yung mga paint sa bahay, mayroong lead. Okay, then eventually, they found out no, na may, may harmful effects pa lang lead sa mga bata. That's why they removed the lead in paint. Okay, actually, yung lead daw, according to studies, it can cause a decrease in IQ in children. Okay. Lead in the body is distributed to the brain, liver, kidney, and bones. It is also stored in the teeth and bones where it accumulates over the time. Human exposure is usually affected through the measurement of lead in the blood. So ang specimen natin dito po would be blood. Okay? Lead in bone is released into the blood during pregnancy and becomes a source of exposure to the developing fetus. So even sa fetus, no, may effect ang lead. Okay? There's no level of exposure to lead that is known to be harm uh, with be without harmful effects. So even just a little amount of lead is harmful. Okay, we avoid it as much as possible. And uh, uti na lang, lead exposure is preventable. Of course, how do you prevent it? Okay, by removing the sources of lead in your household or in your workplace. Okay. Now remember, guys. So periodic table, ang uh, abbreviation ng lead is PB. Okay? Siguro yung mga nakakalala ng periodic table na sagot nila tong plumbism, no? Okay? PB, ang lead. Bakit? Guys, ang lead po, ang Latin niya is actually plumbum. Okay? Nice to know na to, ha? Ang mga trivia-trivia lang. Okay? Uh, lead, ang Latin niya is plumbum. Kaya naging PB ang kanyang abbreviation sa periodic table. Ito rin po ang root word ng Ano ba yung sounds like plumbum? Ito rin yung root word ng plumber. Okay? Ito yung root word ng plumbing. Kasi nung uh, ancient times, yung pipes nyo, okay, yung mga tubo, 
this were made of lead. Okay? Actually, may theory nga na uh, yung Romans daw, uh, one, of, uh, one, one factor that led to their collapse was the use of lead pipes. So because of the use of lead pipes, maraming na naging effect yung lead sa population nila. Uh, yung mga bata, buhaba IQ, yung mga adults, they suffer from gout, etc. No? Yung mga iba't ibang effects ng lead. Which eventually, of course, ayun, alam naman natin nangyari, nag-collapse ang Rome. Okay, so again, remember, plumbism, this is your lead poisoning. Okay, so may natututunan ba tayo this evening? Yes? All right. Let's continue. Let's go to micro para. Historically, mahirap talaga ang micro para. <laughs> Hindi na kami nagulat na mahirap din ang micro para this uh, board exam, ng previous board exam. So one feedback is that uh, may mga questions about biochem. So we'll have a lecture, separate lecture about your biochem test. No? And nagtatanong na naman sila ng mga callers, no, ng mga results, mga ganyan. Of course, hindi pa rin na uh, mawawala yung mga culture media, uh, yung mga common characteristics ng organisms, and some diseases. No? Ayan. Okay, so first question, enrichment medium po for isolation of Legionella. Nagtanong na to before, na, tas bumalik ulit siya. This is actually your BCYE. Buffered charcoal yeast extract agar. Okay? Before we continue, tignan lang natin yung bang choices. Para saan po ang Lowenstein Jensen? Type na sa chat box, guys. Para saan po ang Lowenstein Jensen? You want? Very good. This is for your mycobacteria. Okay? This is a culture medium for mycobacteria. Okay? Kasama niya si Middlebrook. If you remember Middlebrook. TCBS, thiosulfate citrate bile salt sucrose. Remember you know, that this is for your Vibrio. Okay, this is the best culture medium for Vibrio. Okay, very good. You must mas a good chat box. All right. How about your thioglycolate broth? Ang thioglycolate broth, hindi siya specific for any uh, group of organism. Ang importance ng thioglycolate broth is that it can be used to check for oxygen requirement. Okay. We can use this to check kung aerobic ba, kung anaerobic ba, microaerophilic ba yung organism. Okay? So we'll discuss this in a separate lecture, yung thioglycolate broth. Okay? So for now, just remember that si thioglycolate broth, ginagamit natin yan to determine the oxygen requirement of an organism. Okay? Now, I have here a, a table, no? Special culture requirements. So some organisms and their uh, culture media. So hindi ko na isa-isa to, guys. By the way, I'll try to provide the uh, provide the talito handout for this lecture. Okay, so kinig lang muna kayo. Okay, so daan nyo tong table na to pag nareceive nyo na yung notes natin. Okay, maraming kulang dito of course. No, ang, ang ang nandito lang are just the common examples. All right. So next, a large majority of cervical cancers due to which of the following viruses? The answer is your human papilloma virus. Oh, may tanong ako sa inyo guys. Ang human papilloma virus ba? DNA or RNA virus? Type na sa chat box. Alright, how about the others? Okay, very good. So this is actually a DNA virus. In fact, lahat ng nandito po are actually DNA viruses. Okay, bago natin i-discuss itong uh, human papilloma virus, review lang natin, no? Sino-sino ba ang DNA viruses? Sa mnemonics niyo po dito, papa add po, hehe. Okay? So, ano ibig sabihin nito guys? Pa, po, pa, day. Okay? Ano pa yung isang pa? Ah, may mga alam din yung mnemonics natin. Okay, very good. Yung parvo, ito, no? parvo virus. Parvo viridae. Ano yung ad? Ano po yung ad? Okay, very good. Adeno viridae. Memorize yun na, no? Try to memorize this now. How about yung po? Po is box viridae. Very good. Then yung hehe. You have your hepad na viridae. And your, ano isa pang he? Herpes viridae. 
Okay, so these are the DNA uh, viruses. Papa at po he he. Okay. Ang isa pang use ng mnemonics na ito no, is that if you divide this mnemonics into two, so hatiin nyo siya sa gitna, papa-add, saka po he he, you now will remember kung sino yung mga enveloped and kung sino yung mga naked. Okay? So yung po he he, these are the enveloped DNA viruses. Yung papa-add naman, these are the naked DNA viruses. Okay. Can you identify kung anong family po ang hepatitis B virus? Anong family po ang hepatitis B virus? Mamili lang kayo dito sa anim guys. Yun, very good. This is your, uh, part of your hepad na every day. Tingnan nyo guys. Hepad na every day. Hepa. Okay, hepad na beard day. And among your hepatitis viruses, remember this, among your hepatitis viruses, siya po yung nag-iisang DNA virus. Kaya nga hepa DNA, hepad na beard day. Okay, so hepa B virus yung nag-iisang DNA virus among the hepatitis viruses. All the rest are RNA viruses. Okay? Si human papilloma virus, this belongs to your papova, your papo yeah, Papovirde, or sorry, Papovirde. Parvovirus belongs to your Parvovirde. Okay, and then of course, Palioma virus, this also, uh, this also belongs to your Papova. Sorry, to your Papovirde, pa ulit ulit. Papovirde. Papiloma viruses, no? Ang papiloma viruses are notorious for stimulating DNA synthesis. Okay? Because of this, okay, they're significant cause of human cancer, especially cervical cancer. Okay, kaya nga po naging uh, uso yung tinatawag nating HPV na vaccine, human papilloma virus vaccine. Okay, ladies, no, and even gentlemen, no, we encourage you to get your HPV vaccine. And what's the reason? To prevent cervical cancer. No, kasi majority of your cervical cancer is actually tied to HPV infection. Okay, so get your HPV vaccine, no? And what's the benefit to yun, prevent cervical cancer? Viral oncoproteins interact with cellular tumor suppressor proteins. Now we'll not discuss those. No, medyo hindi na part ng discussion natin yung specific na suppressor proteins na yun. Okay, next, which of the following parasites is known to cause vitamin B12 deficiency? Okay, so majority also got this correctly. This is your Diphylobotrium latum. Okay. Yung dalawang nauna, Ancelostoma dodenal and Necatora americanus, these are actually your hookworms. Okay? And ano po ang deficiency naman na associated sa hookworms? Okay, very good. So ang hookworms nagkakos ng iron deficiency. Okay? For the reason that your hookworms attach to your bowel, no, nag-attach sila sa intestine. So imagine ito yung intestine, ayan. Okay, mag-a-attach sila dyan sa walls na intestine and they literally suck blood. So over time, eventually magkaka-iron deficiency ka. Okay? How about Georgia Lamblia? What is the vitamin deficiency associated with Georgia Lamblia? Type nga po sa chat box. Baka may nakakaalam. So ano po yung vitamin deficiency associated with Georgia Lamblia? Anyone? So si Georgia Lamblia naman, associated po siya with vitamin A deficiency. Okay? Vitamin A deficiency. Para maalala nyo ito guys, no? Basahin nyo si Georgia as Georgia. Okay? Georgia. Georgia. Ah, vitamin A deficiency for Georgia Lamblia. Okay? So please remember the deficiencies associated with your parasites. Paboritong tinatanong sa boards po ito. Okay? And even in hematology, baka tanongin din kayo ng uh, uh, anong parasite na no? nagkakos na IDA, no? which is a microcytic hypochromic anemia. Okay? So ang sagot po doon, hookworms. Or anong parasite na nagkakos na megaloblastic anemia. No? That would be your dilatum due to vitamin B12 deficiency. Okay? Next question. Ito the following bacteria. 
produce a characteristic odor resembling apples or strawberries. So, ano lang, no? around one-fourth lang na students na nakatama po dito. The answer is actually alk alkaligenes fecalis. Okay? Kung manguhula kayo, hindi nyo ito sasagutin. Hindi ito yung sasagot nyo. Kasi sa pangalan nyo, pakalan niya, no, na fecalis, amoy mabaho siya. Diba? Pero nakakainis dito guys, si alkaligenes fecalis, actually fruity odor siya. Okay? Fecalis ang pangalan, pero fruity odor siya. And this fruity odor resembles apples or strawberries. Okay, so tandaan nyo natin, anong po ito nung last uh, board exam, yung mga odors na yan. Okay, so we have here a table summarizing the odors that you should know. Okay, so again, hindi ko na po isa-isa yun to guys. I want you to go over this table. I-memorize nyo na as early as possible. Okay, ang isa pang tip ko sa inyo guys, make a flashcard no, ng mga tables na to. Gawa, isulat nyo na sa flashcard para pagka babalikan nyo, mabilis na lang. No? Flip lang kayo ng flip ng flashcard. Kahit na nasa jeep kayo, kahit na nakahiga kayo, mas uh, madali kayo mag-flip ng flashcard. And eventually, uh, via repetition, you'll be able to memorize this. Okay? Natanong na rin before na itong uh, burnt chocolate odor. Sino yung burnt chocolate? Or burnt gun powder? That's produce? Vulgaris. Si Sudumonas Eriginosa naman ang description dyan guys, corn tortilla or override grip. Although ito, lumabas din na fruity. Okay? Pero kasi dito sa question na to, naging specific tayo na apples or strawberries. No? Alkaligenes fecalis yung uh, sagot dito. Bet better answer. Okay, next question. Which of the following is an important virulence factor of H. pylori helping it survive in the acidic environment of the stomach? Okay, so the answer here is urease. Okay? So urease is one of the important enzymes produced by H. pylori. Okay, from the name itself, you know that urease breaks down urea to ammonia and CO2. Okay, yung ammonia na to can cause an increase in pH. And remember, sa stomach natin, acidic, no? mababa ang pH. Kaya, mara, kaya hindi gaano nagsusurvive ang bacteria doon. Okay? So si H. pylori, ang ginagawa niya, magpaproduce na itong urease, which breaks down urea to ammonia. Yung ammonia, okay, gagawin niyang mas basic or mas alkaline yung stomach, allowing now the H. pylori to survive. Okay? So remember, urease, no? very important na uh, virulence factor H. pylori. Okay? H. pylori grows up mali at the pH of 6 to 7. And it would be killed or not grow at the pH within the gastric lumen. So supposedly, hindi po siya nag-grow doon. Okay? H. pylori is found deep in the mucosa layer okay, near the epithelial surface where physiologic pH is present. So nag-grow siya dun sa mucus layer no? ng ating uh, stomach. Okay? H. pylori produces potent urease activity which yields production of ammonia and further buffering of acid. No, allowing now the H. pylori to survive in an acidic environment. Okay? Ito rin po actually yung uh, basis ng tinatawag natin na urea breath test for H. pylori. So yung pasyente, okay, yung pasyente bibigyan po ng uh, drink containing urea. Okay, yung urea na yun, meron siyang radioactive label. Okay. Once na pumunta yung urea sa stomach ng pasyente and yung pasyente natin may H. pylori, the urease will break down the urea. Okay. Pag na-release yung CO2 which contains the radioactive label, madedetect yun ngayon sa breath ng pasyente. Kaya siya tinawag na urea breath test. Okay. Ito po, one thing that you also need to memorize, yung mga urease positive microorganism. So aside from H. pylori, no, marami pang ibang organism na urease positive. Ang mnemonics po natin dito, P-chunks. Okay? So I'll give you time right now to memorize this. So produce. Ano pa? Ito tayo sa chunks. Letter C, Cryptococcus. Letter H, H. pylori. Ano yung letter U? Urea plasma. Okay, letter N, Nocardia. Letter K, Klebsiella. And then, dalawang S, no? Staph epidermidis and Staph subprofiticus. These are urease, positive microorganisms. Very important, guys, na na-memorize natin ito. Kasi pag binigyan kayo ng biochemical identification, tapos nakita niyong urease positive, 
mananaro daw nyo na agad yung mga choices nyo. You just remember, P-chunks. Okay? Let's continue. Let's go to clinical microscopy. Last subject for today, guys. And makakapag-dinner na din tayo. Okay, so question uh, number one for CM. Which of the following anticoagulants is added to syringes used in synovial fluid collection? Okay, so majority got this correctly. The answer is heparin. Okay. Actually, no, yung syringe na ginagamit din for uh, blood gas so sa clinical chem, heparin din ang laman. Okay. So basta syringe, ang, pina, ang nilalagay lang din dyan kadalas yung heparin. No, not not EDTA, not EDTA, not citrate. No? Okay. Synovial fluid collection. Normal synovial fluid does not clot. However, fluid from a diseased joint may contain fibrinogen and, and will clot. Okay, so hindi po nagka-clot ang normal synovial fluid. Therefore, fluid is often collected in a syringe that has been moistened with heparin no? to avoid this clotting from abnormal synovial fluid. When, when sufficient fluid is collected, it should be distributed into the following tubes. So please memorize this too. Okay, so first, sterilize, uh, a sterile heparinized tube for gram stain in culture. Heparin or EDTA tube for cell counts. Okay, non-anticoagulated tube for other tests and sodium fluoride tube for glucose analysis. Okay, so daanan nyo na ulit to. Memorize as much as you can. Heparinized tube, gram stain in culture. Heparin or EDTA, cell counts. Then anticoagulated tube, other test, and then sodium fluoride tube for glucose analysis. Okay? Paboritong tinatanong yun sa CM, yung mga about specimen collection. Not just about synovial fluid, no? All fluids, dapat alam nyo kung paano kinocollect properly. Ayan, remember this, powdered anticoagulants should not be used. No, natanong na rin to before. Powdered anticoagulants should not be used because they may produce artifacts that interfere with Crystal analysis. So, anong part ng synovial fluid uh, examination ang uh, affected by powder anticoagulants? Ang sagot po, crystal analysis. Kaya na pagkakamalang crystals, no, yung mga powder na anticoagulant na yan. Okay, next. Use cells found in the urine are reported as. The answer here is rare, few, moderate, or many per HPF. Personally, nung student ako, ito yung Ayaw na ayaw ko sa clinical microscopy. Ayaw ko talaga nag-memorize before, no? I'm more of an ano, more of understanding ang uh, gusto ko. Pero pag ganito, ayan, wala tayong choice, guys. Tinatanong siya sa boards, no? So please memorize yung mga reporting na yan. Okay? So talk about yeast cells. Yeast cells appear in the urine as small refractile oval structures that may or may not contain a bud. Yeast cells are reported as rare, few, moderate, or many per HPF. Okay? Differentiation between yeast cells and RBCs can sometimes be difficult. So pag tinanong kayo, anong, uh, ano yung napagkakamala, ano, ano yung napagkakamala na yeast cell, no? that would be your RBC. Okay? You also have this table from Strasinger. Guys, mga table sa Strasinger, aralin nyo mabuti, no? Kaya kadalasan, dyan sila kumukuha sa tables talaga. And kadalasan, summary din yan kung ano nasa text. Okay, so make your life easier, go over the tables. Ito rin yung sagot to. There are few moderate or many per HPF. Okay, nakatabulate yan sa Strasinger. Okay, well, next. At which of the following serum glucose levels with glycosuria most likely observed? So the answer here is of course 180 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, bakit 180? Kasi siya po yung umabot ng tinatawag natin na renal threshold. Okay. So for glucose, the renal threshold is, ano po yung renal threshold for glucose? Yan, very good. The renal threshold for glucose is 160, 180 milligrams per deciliter. Ano ba ibig sabihin ng renal threshold na to? Clear ba sa utak niyo guys ano ibig sabihin ng renal threshold? Okay, let's review this. Okay, para maintindihan natin yan, we have to go over renal function again. And of course, for us to understand renal function, we have to review the parts of your nephron. So what do we have here? You have here your glomerulus. Okay, so yung glomerulus nyo, ayan, mga 
capillaries, you know, ang description dyan, tuft or ball of capillaries. And this serves as a filter. Ang glomerulus ninyo, ang function niya is filtration. Okay, so this is one of the renal functions, no, filtration. And this is performed by your glomerulus. Okay? And then you have here your renal tubules. So from the glomerulus, yung fluid na na-filter will pass through your renal tubules. Ito yung yellow po. Yan. Okay. And yung ating renal tubules may parts. So you have here the proximal convoluted tubule. You have the loop of Henle with its descending and ascending limb. And then you also have here the distal convoluted tubule and of course the collecting ducts. These are your renal tubules. Dito po nagpa-pass through yung ating fluid which eventually becomes urine. Okay? Now surrounding this would be blood vessels. Okay? Ayan. So meron kong tinatawag na basa recta. Ayan. These are actually networks of capillary surrounding the renal tubules. Now what? Ano, ano yung iba pang functions aside from filtration? If a substance, so let's say this is your renal tubule and this is your capillary. Okay? Of course, ang nasa renal tubule is uh, your filtrate na maging urine and nasa capillary naman blood. If a substance goes from the urine or from the renal tubule and it goes back to your capillary, this is what we call secretion. Ah, sorry, balik that. This is actually what you call uh, reabsorption. Sorry, sorry. Okay? So from the filtrate, passing through the renal tubule, going back to your blood, that's reabsorption. Reabsorption. No? In a, re reabsorb mo ulit. Binalik mo ulit sa blood. Kasi tinag na reabsorption. Kapag naman from the blood, tinapon natin dun sa filtrate, this is now what you call secretion. Okay? So these are the three functions, no? Filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. These are the three functions which are important in urine formation. Okay? Nag-gets na guys, yung difference ng reabsorption at secretion. So again, pag sinabing reabsorption, yung substance na dumada na dito sa tubules ito, binalik natin sa dugo. Uy, kailangan ko pa ito. Okay? Balik natin sa dugo. Ang tawag doon, reabsorption. From the blood, and then to the urine, hinabol mo, no? Ay, hindi ito kailangan. Tapon natin sa urine. Ang tawag doon, secretion. Okay? Now, ano ba yung renal threshold? Okay? So, for a particular substance, mare-reabsorb yan in a particular part of the nephron or in a particular part of your renal tubule. Okay? However, there is a particular plasma concentration, no? Kung saan hindi na mare-absorb lahat ng ating uh, substance. So, let's say, for example, glucose. Si glucose ni reabsorb natin no. So from the urine, binabalik mo sa dugo. Okay? Eventually, pag sobrang taas nung glucose concentration mo sa urine, hindi mo na ma-reabsorb lahat 'yon. Some of the glucose will now pass out in the urine. So if you exceed the renal threshold for a particular substance, eventually this substance is now excreted in the urine. So for glucose, this renal threshold is 160 to 180. Ibig sabihin, Pag, lumabas, pag lumagpas na yung ating concentration ng 160 to 180, not all glucose is reabsorbed. Some glucose will now be detected in the urine. Yun ang ibig sabihin ng renal threshold. I'm telling you this kasi sa Strasinger, medyo mali yung definition niya. I'm not sure kung na-correct na to sa newer editions. No? Pero yung edition ng Strasinger na meron ako, sabi dito, plasma concentration at which active transport stops is term na renal threshold. This is inaccurate. Okay? Hindi nagsastop yung active transport. Ang nangyayari nga lang, na-overwhelm siya. Nag-gets nyo guys? Na-overwhelm siya. So hindi na na -re reabsorb lahat. Some of the substance is now excreted in the urine. Yun ang renal threshold. So for glucose, please remember, the renal threshold is 160 to 180. Okay? Glucose appears in the urine when the plasma concentration reaches this level. Klaro yun guys, na, na ano nyo ba, na mas nalimanagan ba kayo regarding this threshold? Okay, parang estudyante lang yan eh. Uh, Mag-aaral ako isa libro, okay pa. Buhay pa ako. Mag-aaral akong dalawang libro, okay pa. Buhay pa ako. Pero pag binigyan mo ako ng isang daang libro, okay, of course may limit din ako. Mababasa ko man yung iba, hindi ko na mababasa yung iba. So yung limit na yun, that's your renal threshold.
Okay? Next, fecal contamination of a urine specimen can also result in the presence of ova from intestinal parasites in the urine sediment. The most common contaminant is ova from, okay, marami nakasagot dito ng tama. This is your enterobius vermicularis. Okay, very good. So, fecal contamination of a urine specimen can also result in the presence of ova from intestinal parasites in the urine sediment. The most common contaminant is ova from your pinworm, which is your enterobius vermicularis. Okay, so sa, paristo, sa parasitology, ang description dito, no? D-shaped egg. Okay, so hopefully nare-recognize nito, guys. Okay, this is your enterobius vermicularis ova. Bakit siya nakikita sa urine? Bakit kadalasan nakikita rin siya sa urine? Or bakit madalas na yung contaminant siya sa urine? Saan po ba na-de-deposit itong ova na enterobius vermicularis? Anyone? Yun. Well, not sa inus mismo, no? Ang uva na to na de-deposit sa tinatawag nating perianal skin. Yung skin na nakapalibot dun sa anus. Okay? So remember, at night, the adult enterobis vermicularis goes out of the anus. Okay? Tapos mag-explore siya kaunti dyan. Tapos mag-de-deposit siya ng egg dun sa perianal skin. And then babalik siya dun sa anus. Okay, so that happens at night. So that in the morning, you can now perform your scotch tape technique and you'll be able to demonstrate the ova of your enterobus vermicularis. Okay, tinatanong din yun. Para sa ng scotch tape technique? Well, the answer is for the detection of enterobus vermicularis. Ito rin yung reason kung bakit ang common na sign nito no, is yung tinatawag natin pruritus ani. Pruritus meaning itchy. No? Pruritus ani. Makate, yung perianal skin. Yun yung kadalasang manifestation ng enterobis vermicularis. Okay? Because of this deposition. Of course, pagka umihi ka, okay? especially for the ladies, no? kapag nag-drip yung urine somewhere dun sa perianal skin, pwedeng masama yung egg. Okay? Next question. Normal synovial fluid forms a string that measures. Maraming nagkamali po dito. Okay? So, 40, uh, 45%, 46% answer 2 to 4. Okay? Ang tama sagot po, 4 to 6 centimeters. Okay? So please memorize the uh, the normal values for your uh, different uh, fluids. Okay? Nakatabulate naman sila sa Strasinger, no? Try to copy that as early as possible sa flashcards. Para pagdating ng review, may bawon-bawon ka na. Babasahin mo na lang, ulit-ulitin mo na lang. Okay? Remember, repetition is the key. Okay? So for your Synovial fluid, okay, ang normal viscosity is represented by the ability to form a string 4 to 6 centimeters long. So again, 4 to 6 centimeters long. Ang isang pang natatanong dito yung volume. So ang volume po ng synovial fluid should be less than 3.5 ml. Yung normal. No, less than 3.5 ml. Okay? So yan. Of course, malay nyo iba, iba yung tanong. You know? So please memorize all of this. Okay, so we're done with part one. Okay, it's already uh, 8 to 6, sakto, one hour tayo. Okay, do you have questions, guys? Did you learn something uh, tonight? May natutunan po tayo. Alright, thank you guys for attending our rationalization. We'll have part two soon, siguro next week na, no? Since I'll be busy uh, this weekend. Punta tayong vegan before Bagnet. <laughs> Okay, thank you guys and uh, have a great evening. Dinner na po tayo. Wala po na questions, ha? Okay, stop ko na yung recording.